2004. Will you please um, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Uh, Sylvia, roll call, please. Mayor Middleton is currently absent. Council President Henderson. Oh, here. Council Grant. Here. Council Butterfield. Here. Council Langer. Here. Council Clark. Here. Thank you. Council President Henderson, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, amend the agenda. Okay. I'd like to, uh, uh, in a single motion, uh, move that we change item 10, citizen comments, to council announcements, since we have citizen comments uh, prior on item six, I also like to change item twelve from adjourn to motion to adjourn. Point of order: We didn't notice that we were having council comments. Pardon me. We didn't notice that we were having council comments. Did the mayor approve the agenda as it's as it's written tonight? And the council announced that council comments was not added to the agenda at that time. Okay, but we didn't notice to the public that we were going to be having council comments. So. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure that's all right with you. Sure. Second. Okay, so all in favor of a motion to agend to a motion to amend the agenda tonight by replacing item ten with council announcements and amending item twelve with motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Um, is Ian Payton here. Okay. Ian is a, a Boy Scout who has attained the rank of Eagle Scout, and we invited him to attend, but he, we did not hear from him, so hopefully we'll hear from him uh, next council meeting. Council President Henderson, we yes. need to address the consent agenda. Oh, sorry. I moved right on. Uh, we have uh, consent to approve, approval of September 16th, 2014 City Council meeting minutes. Move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Motion to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Citizen comments? Oh. Let's see. Mara Broadhurst is the first sheet I have. Make sure your button's up. Mara Broadhurst, Sherwood. Thank you for addressing the sign anarchy in Sherwood. Having clearly identified rules that are the same for everybody is the only way to promote the democratic process. Not allowing signs in the roundabouts was a good decision. Putting in the muck was not safe. Many <coughs> residents already took the signs down in front of their property anyway. <coughs> So respect for one's domain was a critical issue. I think the candidates should try to get their signs taken down that are clearly in violation and show respect for the code, not turn a blind eye. Rules are not a joke, and no one should be allowed to flagrantly disregard the law. When noting the signs on the highway, there was one for vehicles, etc., rental spaces. We own property on 99W whose value and development potential is highly affected by these activities. The RV storage behind the antique mall has been allowed to expand with no highway improvements to ensure safety pulling on and off the highway or ground improvements to stop oily discharge from contaminating Cedar Creek. In my opinion, there is a newly created RV storage park next door, expanding and recruiting new business. Why is this allowed? that use is not to code. Are there any required land use improvements to develop this use and allow it to continue and expand? Did the city levy fines and initiate a lawsuit to have this property conform with the code? Did the city come to a settlement to allow this use and give this property special, con special development concessions not allowed to others? Did the council vote on this or was it a staff decision? The ability of the police to enforce code violations is determined by the staff. 
Why can the staff discriminate on who gets enforced on and who gets to break the law? This preferential treatment is a problem in the area that has resulted in multiple lawsuits. And even after that, the illegal activity still continues. We would also like to make money to pay the high taxes while being forced to hold on. We've always cooperated with the city and allowed access and road changes over our property for the advancement and the good of the city. Allowing out of code lucrative uses grants unfair advantage and destroys any need or urgency for development cooperation in the area. I hope the council will investigate this and the police can do their job with due process for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Tammy Steffens. Hello. Um, thank Hi. you, Tammy Steffens, 23617 Southwest Voss Place, Sherwood, Oregon, 97140. I'm here um, speaking as a citizen, not as a um, city employee, and I'm representing the Sherwood High School Booster Club and Bowman Football. So the Booster Club has our annual auction this Saturday, starting at 5.30. We have it at a new venue. It's going to be at the Embassy Suites, Washington Square. Tickets are still available until tomorrow at SherwoodBoosterClub.com. They're $50 a seat, or you can get a table for $500, and that would include um, 10 drink tickets to go with it. This goes to support the um, student-athletes at Sherwood High School. The um, athletic budget continues to be um, cut because of budget issues, and so um, this is the major fundraiser of the year for Sherwood High School Booster Club, and we ask everyone to come and, and join in the fun. Um, now, as far as uh, representing Bowman football, we have a Stuff the Truck event coming up on Halloween at the football game. That's our last home regular season football game versus Newburgh. And um, it is for, we used to call it the Think Pink game, and now we're just calling it the Cancer Awareness game um, because it, it's all types of cancer. Um, childhood cancer's color is gold, and this year we are dedicating this game to sophomore leukemia fighter Emma Andrude. And um, so it will, she's a sophomore at the high school. She's on the dance team. Great girl. So um, it's a real special game for us. Um, the two foundations that are represented are the Michael Hicks, my, excuse me, Chelsea Hicks Foundation and Michael Grimm Foundation, and we collect. Um, it needs to be new. Both need to be new because of um, the infection uh, possibility at the hospitals. Um, but we collect teddy bears or actually any kind of stuffed animal, and then also costumes like Halloween type costumes. But the kids actually dress at, up in them throughout the year, um, so costumes and accessories. And if anyone is not going to be attending the football game that day, feel free to bring your um, donation to me. Um, just upstairs, you can leave it at the counter, at the reception desk, and I'm happy to take your donation for you. Thank you. What day is that game? So that's on Friday. It's on Halloween. Oh, okay. Friday, October 31st at 7 o'clock. Here? Okay. Yeah, at home game. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Our claws. Uh, Robert James Claus, two 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 one one Southwest Pacific Highway. Well, I've been attending your public debates. I have some suggestions for them. Now, you can't do like the San Francisco police did. And that's wash the Berkeley students out when we protested the House on American Activity Committee because your cops don't have a fire hose. You'd have to bring somebody over. You could do it, but you just don't have a fire hose. And I've watched how each time your attendance is going down in the debates. Now, the way we got our attendance up at Berkeley and Stanford is those public forums were pretty rough and tumble. But now you don't want to do that. You want to get somebody in that wants everybody to love everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's really funny. So I have a new idea. I think you need another one. 
I think you need to feature something like an Aryan Queen cheerleading group up front, because that would get some people in. You know, they could jump around and say, hey, Ray, Ray, and they could cheer and push buttons. And then we could have Matt, because you're not going to run again. You get one of those things and have a thing lease for rent and run around, and we could have the staff run around and back up and say, we support business. Now, that would get some people attending, because they might be interested in leasing. And Dave could offer goods for sale, and the staff could say it's honorable. And Bill, I got the best idea all for you. Let's give you a flashlight and say, I light up fields. And we'll put it on your back. Because people will be there, and they'll appreciate, particularly if you spotlight the, the candidates. And Chris, we've got a role for you, like Sand Creek for Shivington. You can run around and say, I prosecute women and children. I don't fool with the men. Shivington was pretty good at that. Didn't work out too well when the press found out about it, and we never got to be governor and so on because he didn't like it. Then you can say the staff can be there and say they invented the refuge, and then they can talk about how they're preserving erosion, although our major channels are destroying things, but it'll be really good to say because it might have values. Now, why am I saying this? Because if you're going to hold these forum candidates, make up your mind if it's a clown show, if it's a feel-good show, or if it's really a democratic activity. Every person I have shown this to that's a law professor ends up laughing and making a remark. I thought political speech was about character impugning. I thought that's what it was about. You're saying the other person doesn't have judgment. But in this town, we say that's not true. So if you're going to continue to do these foolish public debates, at least get an entertainment value. And then maybe you could charge 50 cents or a dollar at the door and you contribute to the football team. Because the way you're hosting these is a sad, sad joke on what they're supposed to be about. Exactly why you're there is why did you do what you did? Why did you pass a contract on a building two and a half years early? Why did you then hold phony public hearings? You may have good reasons. Why did you allow PUD to be parceled? You may have good reasons. That's what a public debate is for. What it's not for, and it's too bad now because we picked on poor old Castro to you got to go to Mexico, to Canada, to get a good cigar. But it's not back film rooms, and it's not things that are feel-good public debates. So if you're going to do it, at least follow the Hollywood model and turn it into entertainment. Remember the Great Sioux Massacre when we were busily slaughtering and Shivington was a hero? Made good entertainment and they made money. Tried the same. Susan Claus is next. Um, can, before I start, can I ask a question? Um, you, you have citizen comments at the end. I'd prefer to go at the no, end of the meeting. Pardon me. We actually amended the agenda to include council comments tonight. So citizen comments is just at the beginning. Okay. Is, so. Has anything else been amended on the agenda? Uh, just the very last item under 12, which is motion to adjourn. That's it. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. Um, so I, ha I have a couple um, things that I just wanted to talk about. Um, and just to give the council an update on. Um, the uh, as far as uh, the political season and and the signage, which I know that some people object to that, but there's some ways that that's just the fundamental way that people communicate um, with the other citizens. Um, the um, hand painted signs, there's been over a hundred of them lost, stolen, whatever. Um, and it, it's still a great concern. Um, and it, it's one of those things, I don't know what the solution is. Um, and we've th there's been defacement of signs. Um, um, so the really great thing is, I think that you guys have had plenty of time um, that we've heard from the um, your views in the Oregonian, your views in the Gazette. Uh, we had the public forum 
and um, with the chamber and um, the ballots are coming out. So we're kind of a closing down on the season. So um, I, I wanna also say that I um, appreciate Joe Gall. Um, he's been working with us on an issue and I know he takes a lot of heat in a lot of different ways for a lot of different um, issues. And both he and Tom have been working with us. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and, and just, uh, I, I just have a fundamental concern too. Um, as elected le leaders of our community, it would be really great for the rest of this political season if you guys were all on the high road and we all just we're doing our thing and the citizens are gonna make their decision. Um, the, some of this infighting is just really disappointing. Uh, and we're better than that. We're better than that as a city. And, and it's not what our citizens expect us. So, um, you know, I wish everybody good luck and um, your views are all out there. We appreciate it and We've had a lot of public forums and a lot of opportunities to know what you guys um, are, you know, want to share with us if you're elected. Um, and just wanted to tell you thank you and appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Nancy Taylor. Nancy Taylor, Sherwood, Washington, Oregon. Um, unlisted phone number, but uh, taxpayer, homeowner. Oh, like, sorry about that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the public debates, and um, I was very disappointed with one question and one question only, and that was the student's question. It seemed like a throwaway because their question was not based in a, based in an answer that you all could give. But after I thought about it, I thought there is a lot that the city of Sherwood does for students. And there are things that could have been mentioned like we provide the safety of the police department. At the school, we provide a safe venue for children to feel like they can go to school. I know that I served on the traffic um, board and we talked about ways to make it safer for students to walk to school and ride their bikes to school. So there is a lot that is done by this board. There's a lot that's done by the mayor. And I was a little disappointed that it was so taken back by the question because it was, I thought that uh, the students had somebody that was working with them to give them questions that would have been relevant to what's going on in the city. Anyway, that was one thing. Um, I also wanted to mention the signs. I started out with 14 signs that I was placing every weekend in different areas. And I found that the one sign that got the most harassment was the one I placed in front of the police department, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. Uh, last week, somebody beat me to my favorite place. And so I put it across the street. And when I went back to pick it up, of course, somebody had picked it up and thrown it. And then I thought, well, that's odd. <laughs> so anyway, if you guys want to watch a tape of what's going on in front of the police department. Um, is it juvenile? You bet. Did I go back and find another sign when I saw one missing and try to replace it? You bet. Did I walk around later and try to find the sign so that it wasn't considered trash and waste? You bet. Um, but it's sad. It's sad to think that probably not children, probably grown adults that had maybe had a bit too much to drink probably did this kind of silly behavior. And I hope um, in the few weeks we have left before we all vote, that we take a deep breath and we let everybody have their 20 feet <laughs> space. And it's only the weekend, folks. It's not every day unless, of course, it's on private land. And then if it's on private land, I do want to say that this time I've been very lucky and nobody's come on my property and taken my signs. I think they learned from the last time that I do put things on the signs so that if they take them, they, they maybe sneeze later or have a reaction. So anyway, um, remember to vote. Remember to think while you're voting. It's, again, I'll repeat, living in Oregon, the most wonderful thing is that we get a voter's pamphlet and we get to read about each and every person, not only in the newspaper, but in the voter's pamphlet. 
So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Dan King. Back here again, Daniel King, 17864 Southwest Hanley Street. Um, I can say if I am elected that we are going to deal with a sign code, definitely. <laughs> so um, the only thing I would suggest is that maybe if we could have the code enforcement officer um, work for a couple hours on the weekend, since that seems to be the only time that most of the signs are up and can be enforced. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it'll cost a little bit of money, but I think it would be worth it. That's a, just a suggestion. Um, and the other thing I wanted to address, and unfortunately the mayor's not here tonight, is his little uh, letter to the editor about me and Ross Schultz in there. Um, you know, I can, he's back to his doing his own thing again and attacking people in the forum. And I prefer as a, as a, a public servant and a, uh, serving on the board that, you know, I would attack ideas and not people. Um, unfortunately, he's not here tonight. Um, so, if he shows up again at another meeting, I'm going to address this issue. I'm going to have to. I have a couple of questions I want to ask him. So, anyway, I appreciate the time you've given me, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one I have is Tony Bevel. Tony Bevel, uh, Southwest Lindley, Sherwood. Um, we started off the evening with a little bit of levity. I got the joke. I hope everybody else did. Um, I'd like to continue with that. Um, I kind of, um, I know, I wish you had not voted on changing the agenda for the evening because what brought me here tonight was the last portion of it was about the marijuana, you know, that uh, great evil weed, which is going to destroy us all. But hey, I'm jesting, you know, okay. Mr. All right, Bell, but anyway. Mr. Uh, Bell, we are going to take a public comment. On that? Yes. Oh. Well. <laughs> you said you weren't going to take? Yeah. All right, then. Can I save my, uh, or you can take uh, 45 minutes No, out. you can come. Yeah, you, you're able to come back and testify because it's a separate item. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and I had one last um, sheet, Jennifer Harris. Hi, Jennifer Harris, Sherwood. I just came up, um, I wasn't going to say anything, but I am getting so disheartened by this whole campaign thing. I'm somewhat new to the process, having not run for office before, and I feel like I'm in a junior high campaign. I have never seen this behavior from grown people, especially grown people who are in a position of leadership. I don't tend to get emotional, and it's making me emotional. I'm embarrassed for our city, and I'm not pointing any fingers in any one direction. I see it, Henderson supporters, Clark supporters, it is out of control. The signs are out of control. It's a sign. Who cares if it's two inches too big? or two inches too small. I, I, I opted, I'm running for council, I opted not to get into the sign craziness because it's so divisive. And I'm struggling to get my name out there because of that. And that's my own choice and I understand I might pay the price for that. But I just am shocked at this. And maybe this is normal, maybe this is what happens in other cities and other towns and things like that. But as somebody coming from the outside and I just want to say, can we just stop? Like, I think Susan said it best, just ignore it. If you hear somebody talking about you or saying something about you, just ignore it. I, that's what I'm teaching my eight-year-old. Just move on and get past it. And again, I apologize if this is not the right form for this, but I just think I'm just embarrassed to say that I even live in Sherwood at this point because it's gotten so crazy, especially on social media. I mean, people are talking about guns and watch what that person's doing. Do they know what you've got in your house? And, oh, do they know I'm going to do this to their house? And do they know what you're capable of? And, I mean, it's crazy. 
I just, it's just shocking to me. I feel like I'm in the middle of Young and the Restless or something. So <laughs> I'm just saying, if we could just all let it go, I think that everyone's right. The information's out there. Our articles are out there. Our answers are out there. People have mostly made their decisions. People who are in here have already made their decisions. And the people who haven't out there are probably people who are going to read and figure it out. The sign on the side of the road is not going to make up anybody's mind. The bigger the sign doesn't mean, oh, they had bigger signs. I'm going to vote for them. They had smaller signs. They had more signs. I don't think it matters. I just think we all need to get on with life and get on with the city business. Thanks. <clears throat> I can't read this. Tim Voorhees. Oh, that's Tim. Oh, <laughs> Tim Voorhees. I can read the P.O. box. Oh, good. So, Sorry about that's okay. I didn't see it. I was paying attention. Them. Tim Voorhees, uh, P.O. Box 908, Sherwood, Oregon, uh, owner of Steel Tech Industry out on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, I hear a lot about political signs and stuff, and there's been federal court rulings and stuff that says political speech is the only way against for the citizens to voice their opinions about the candidates and things going on. There isn't a law out there that says we can't put any sign on our property even though Chris Crane over there says that there is and stuff, but you can't touch them. You can't touch them. So that being said, I'm happy the way this election's going. I haven't seen too much vandalism going on except for what happened on my property. Um, past events that's happened where I've come up here and spoke with the city council and stuff and had bottle rockets bounced off my roof at Steel Tech. Different things have happened. This town needs to grow up. It needs to grow up a lot. We as the people of Sherwood deserve better from everybody that we put in office here. Everybody from the city staff down to the ground. I want to give a compliment to the city uh, water district. They're awesome. Had a major break. They helped me out and stuff. They worked with me all the way through. They're great. Um, the other thing is I'm bringing up is you got to do something about those street trees on sunset. You're going to lose every sidewalk out there. Either cut them down and put in the proper ones, or you're going to have trip hazards and lawsuits. The streets are starting to buckle. The sidewalks are starting to lift. You're going to see a real big problem next year. But what I really am concerned about is what is the city so afraid of with the change coming into this direction? I don't know. Is there something bad hidden someplace? I don't know. I'm curious to find out. I don't know what's happening. Walmart coming in. I knew five years ago it was coming in. We mentioned it. Staff said they didn't know who it was. But they came in anyway. Well played. Well played, Matt. I work with developers throughout Portland. And they're the ones that told me about it, that it was going to be coming in. So the things that you have to do is to have integrity and be able to look yourself in the mirror in the morning. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tim. Okay, any more? 
There was one more. I wanted to. That was two. That's it. No. Oh, okay. There was one more. Test please. Test. Test oh, please. sorry. I you. Last one. How many times have I said that? It's like I knew, um, I knew it was test, right. keys. Sorry. I knew it was I just didn't know where you put it. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Tess Keys, and I live on Main Street in Sherwood for at least six more weeks till they tear that house down and build eight more. Um, <coughs> the only thing I wanted to say tonight is I think it's great that uh, we had a debate at the up, high school. Yeah, we'll back up from the oh, mic just sorry. a little bit, please. Sorry. That we had a debate at the high school. Is that better? Yes. Um, but, uh, but in sitting here, that was a very unsatisfactory venue and then um, I think for so that children could learn some things I would like to challenge all of you to another debate I think that our city deserves that I don't think there would be a great expense for that and I think that in all honesty there needs to be a list of questions that we've all had concerns about that we've all been whether it's Walmart the Y or the police department we need to have clarification from the sources that made those statements what exactly their purposes were and how that's going to affect our city no matter who the mayor or the council people are so I would ask you all to take Joe Gallup on his offer to have that debate in whatever venue we can do that in um, soon obviously so that people that have not made their decisions yet can ten, attend that debate and listen to the candidates and see what they have to say. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is an Eagle Scout recognition, but Ian is not here tonight, so hopefully he'll be here next. Uh, next item is new business, resolution 2014-063, declaring Sherwood City Council seat vacant. Mr. Gall. Good evening, Council. Um, this resolution is the next step in the process. You may recall that Councilor, or now former Councilor Robin Folsom, resigned recently, leaving a vacancy currently on the Council. Um, the first step in that process to potentially fill that vacancy is for the Council to officially declare a vacancy, and that's what this resolution is for tonight. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I can answer questions specific to the resolution, but after consideration of the resolution, um, hopefully we can discuss and get some direction from council on whether you're going to fill the vacancy on an interim basis or not, um, because this resolution, because there's more than 13 months left in her term, Ultimately, the voters are going to decide in March of 2015 who is going to fill the remaining portion or the, the majority of the portion of Councillor Folsom's term. So you have a gap there that, as a council, you may or may not choose to appoint someone to fill on an interim basis. And if you do choose to appoint someone, what's that process look like? And I think um, the public, we've the staff's been trying to give you some directions and some ideas, but it's ultimately up to you as as a council to decide how you, how you want to fill that vacancy or if you want to fill that vacancy. Um, we're ready to proceed with some direction tonight on, on that latter half. So it's really a two-part issue. The resolution is more of an official de declaration and then I think some discussion after the resolution's um, decision on next steps. Well, I'll go ahead and move that we um, approve resolution 2014-063 so that we discuss the details after that. That's my motion. A second. Any second. comment on the motion? Okay. Uh, resolution 2014-063, resolution declaring Sherwood City Council seat vacant. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Joe, could you go over the what the code outlines as far as a process goes? After we've declared a vacancy, we have to follow up a, a, a process, and I'm not sure everybody's had an opportunity to read the packet. So if you could just, or Sylvia, go through that process, and then I'll, I'll go over the the key sections, uh -huh. and I would in, um, ask either Sylvia and or Chris if I miss anything. Um, there's a couple of pertinent sections when it comes to filling a vacancy. Um, I think. Uh, the city charter, section 32, is important to note um, that basically says a mayor or councilor vacancy will be filled by an election if 13 months or more remain in the office term. 
The election will be held at the next available election date to, the, to fill the vacancy for the remainder of the term. A mayor or council vacancy may be filled by appointment by a majority of the remaining council members. The appointee's term of office runs from appointment until the vacancy is filled by election or until expiration of the term of office if no election is required to fill the vacancy. So that's out of your charter and that basically, and that's what you were doing tonight with the resolution is declaring the seat vacant. There's more than 13 months left in the term. So the ultimate decision is gonna be the voters in the next available election, which is March, 2015. So that's really what that, that section talks about. And by declaring the vacancy tonight, you've instituted that, um, that process to begin. So then in the code, a, sec a second section, it talks about vacancies and filling of them. So I'm just gonna read from the code because it's pretty clear. Filling a vacancy. Upon becoming aware of a vacancy in an elective office, the council must promptly determine and declare the date of vacancy. You've done that with the resolution. A vacancy in an elective office must be filled as provided by city charter section 32, which is the section I just read um, out loud. Appointment by council. In filling a vacancy, the council may make inquiries and hold interviews as it considers necessary for the appointment. The appointment may be made at a regular or special council meeting. The council will use the following procedures in the appointment process. Number one, public notice to appropriate neighborhood organizations, civic groups, a newspaper of general circulation, and other recognized groups. Two, deadline for submitting application at least two weeks after the notice. And then three, appointment from those applicants nominated and seconded for consideration by members of the council. The recorder will announce the results of each ballot and will record each councilor's ballot. An applicant who receives a majority of the votes by the current council members will be appointed to the vacant position. If no applicant receives a majority vote on the first ballot, the council will continue to vote on the two applicants who receive the most votes until an applicant receives a majority of the councilors voting. So we have given you some documents um, with some potential dates, but I think what you need to decide is a series of questions. Are you gonna fill the vacancy on an interim basis? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, when are you gonna take, how long are you gonna keep uh, the application process open? You have a, obviously a November 4th election, so I think there's some discussion that you're probably going to have about um, how that ties into the election when you have so many people. We have nine people running for three seats, so obviously everyone's not going to win. Um, so that's going to be a decision tonight, how long you're going to keep that application process open. Uh, we gave you a sample application form that we've used in the past. Um, that we've uh, asked you to consider in terms of what that application would look like. We've also given you a, a draft public notice um, that we're ready to fill in the blanks and actually get into, probably going to do it in both the Oregonian and the Tiger Times um, in terms of the, the legal notice, but we will also um, hopefully um, get information out as many different venues as possible so people know how long it's going to take for you to take applications. So that's another decision point you need to make. And then ultimately, when you receive all the applications, what you're gonna do next as a council? Are you gonna hold interviews? Are you gonna interview everybody? When are you gonna do that? I think the, the more clarity that we can provide tonight and decisions that you as the remaining council members can make the better the process will be, uh, and the public will know what, what the process will be uh, to get appointed on an interim basis. So it's a series of questions that um, we'd like to get answered tonight from the council. We've given you some suggestions, but this is really largely a council decision, not a staff decision. So does that help at all in mm -hmm. terms of what we need to talk about tonight? Does anybody have any questions for Joe? No, but I would just say for the public's benefit, thanks for asking all those questions right there. But there's, those questions have been discussed a lot 
previously to the meeting, so we've got a good understanding of the process and what's going on here ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, the council has not had an opportunity to sit down as a body, and other than declaring the vacancy, we have not had an opportunity to have a discussion about filling it or not filling it, if we have a deadline, if we have interviews, and potentially, obviously, we know what we have to do if we choose to interview or notice, interview, and appoint, but we have not, as a body, talked about any dates. So I believe that's the direction that staff is asking. That's what we're seeking from us you. tonight. Tonight. Mm -hmm. um, if we do not have a council meeting on election night, which we're slated not to have a meeting, then obviously the next meeting in which we could make an appointment happen would be um, November 18th. And staff presided us with a. Well, yeah, we also have this handy schedule of yes. calendar that's got kind of got it all laid out already. So yeah, pretty helpful. So the format that we have in front of us is similar to the application that you fill out when you apply for a board or a commission appointment. I did send out a suggestion to council this afternoon that about adding um, a question that. Um, would give candidates an opportunity to talk about the things that they're concerned about or they think are important for our community. And I don't remember the exact verbiage, but it was something like, um, can you please indicate what you think are the top three most important issues facing Sherwood in the next two years? So I don't know how the council feels about that. I haven't spoken to anybody about um, that question. So first of all, um, do we as a body intend to fill the position? Yes. Yes? So if the election's in March, then we wouldn't seat um, until the election was certified in April sometime? Is that right? It would be like a five-month position. December through, right. through April. So until the election comes, there, there'd either be a vacancy for six months or somebody in the seat <coughs> for mm -hmm. five months, I guess. Well, yeah, you know, according to this calendar, isn't it November 18th? Yeah. When you well, that would be the in. earliest we could appoint somebody. Yeah, if you notice tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, well, we don't have to notice tomorrow, but <coughs> we have to give at least two weeks, and I would... I would advocate for more than two weeks for pe for folks to apply. So if, so if we can go through these just to kind of stay on track, obviously everyone got head nods that you want to fill the position on an interim basis. How long a period um, to keep it open is the next question. And I have a question. So sure. we definitely, I, I agree, we, we want to fill the position, but I'm just wondering if you know, we have a new council coming on if we should wait for the new council to fill the position. Because a large portion of our council will be gone. So, you know, wouldn't it, I mean, if the people who are elected are the people who are representing the people Your at button. that point. Oh, I'm sorry. Button. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, if, if the people that are elected to fill those positions um, of the current seated counselors that will not be there any longer, um, and then myself or Linda will even, you know, leave our seat as well, wouldn't it be prudent to be the best representation of the citizens to wait until after the election to fill the position? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. And so, and, and that, the, the downside of that is the seat sits vacant for uh, a few months, because by the time they come in and notice in January, you wouldn't be able to appoint anybody till like late February, and then the person's in the seat for maybe uh, six or eight weeks, and then there's an election. So that I mean, the seat's vacant now. You may as well let somebody sit in there for the next five months. But what what really super important business are we going to be hitting? We don't we don't have a lot in November and December. Uh, in January that we just absolutely positively have to have someone in the seat. I don't, you know, Robin's out of her seat already, and I don't think that it's necessarily something that is just um, kind of an emergency 
I think that we want to be most representative of our citizens. I, I think we want to strive to represent the citizens as best we can. And so I think that the new council would be the most representative because they will have been just elected. So um, I'm just concerned that, you know, we try to quickly get it done for, for what, for two meetings? You know, that doesn't seem that important to me. Well, I think actually, it's more important that it's representative. Yeah, it would be until April. The person would sit because there's not an election until March, not certified till April because it's the third. Right, but Tuesday. the two meetings is what I mean is the two meetings that the person should this council appoint would be seated for t basically two meetings because there's really nothing going on. Well, it would be in more December. than that because this, the other council wouldn't even start the process till January, so that you wouldn't appoint anybody till February. So by then you've missed another probably three or four meetings. So you're you're really talking about a deficit of holding that seat open for an additional five or six meetings. It's not just two. No, it, well, it yeah, because the new council years, won't right? be seated till early January. So then they, right. if you look at this calendar, they start a six week process. So it's the end of February before they appoint. So yeah, it's a lot more than two meetings. But again, what's the emergency status? <clears throat> I mean, it's not an emergency, for, but, you know, ev everyone yeah. before and after the election was elected the by the citizens, including myself. Oh, no, I know that. No, no, I know. But, I mean, just to be most representative moving forward, which well, is what this person would be doing. They'd, they'd be with the new council. Right, but we're all representative of the, of the citizens because we were all elected, every single one of us. And our decisions today are for, for, for the future, even today. That's just my opinion. Okay. Well, another question I had um, was, uh, that, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of it. Another, another question uh, that, I, that I had is, um, if, are we going to interview, uh, let's say, 30 people apply? You know, it could happen. Uh, I think it's unlikely 30. But, but our, uh, one of the ideas I've heard that some, I think sometimes may have done is, is if we get a good application, out where we get tons of questions that we might questions that we might ask in an interview, uh, get those on the application so that the applicant has time to thoughtfully answer them, um, you know, in their own home. Then we could narrow it down to the people we interview. So we're not putting ourselves in a position of having to have these shotgun interviews that are too short for the applicant. And we could narrow it down, pick some number that we're going to interview. And, and, and then kind of have a two-step process, narrow, narrowing it down to fewer people in case we have so many applicants that we really can't do those applicants justice in an interview. I'd like, to give, I'd like to give them plenty of time in an interview, and it could really be stressful trying to get all those done And if there's that many. Do we want to narrow it down? I, I think it would be a good way to, to, to pick through it, and, and I think it would be better for the applicant. They could answer the questions in their home mostly. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that was one of my motivations for adding the question to the yeah. application form because it's fairly, you know, factual or generic, was that they would have an opportunity to think about what's most important um, mm -hmm. to them or most important concern that they have that they want to um, convey to the council about why they're applying. Um, if we want to choose a list of questions, we can certainly do that at a future time. We're not doing that tonight. That's true. We do not have to define the questions tonight. But we could meet in small groups and come up with a list of five or seven questions and then make them available to everybody who applies mm -hmm. ahead of time. And then they would apply, fill out their information, and then we would sit down and have a 15, 20-minute interview. Um, I don't know if I agree with uh, weeding it down. I'd okay. probably interview everybody. Right. Um, I don't think we're going to get... Um, we might get double digit, but I'm not sure it would be that many, but I think if everybody's going to take the opportunity to apply, then we should. Okay. It was just suggested in, to in me. In return, and I just to throw go it ahead out. and interview I, you know, everybody. I've got the time, but it could get awfully late if it's that many. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. One thing I was proposed, what I would like to suggest is that when we have a chance to look at dates, that we propose, um, interviewing on a Saturday, um, one of the reasons that 
and, and for some people that won't be ideal, but I think that we could be flexible. People won't have potentially who worked all day long, then won't come and have an interview. They're tired. They haven't really had um, a lot of time to um, prepare if they've come right from work. If we did it on a Saturday, people would have a little bit more um, opportunity to, you know, mentally prepare and, and maybe not be so um, tired after working a long day or spending all day with your kids or whatever your day, and we can make slots available in the morning as well as the afternoon. And yeah, it will be a long day, but I think it's important enough to dedicate the time. So, Mr. Butterfield? Well, I agree. I think we need to interview everybody, give everybody an opportunity. I'd also like to know how long is this seat actually going to be vacant? We've, we've bandered around two meetings, three meetings, six meetings, eight meetings. Joe? It depends on the process you pick. So again, we gave you a roadmap that I think November 7th would be the deadline for applications. And we need, uh, and Sylvia, you can chime in here, we need enough time to coordinate that interview schedule um, in terms of getting uh, everything scheduled. We don't know how many people we're going to interview. We could get five applicants. You can get 20 applicants. Um, so it's hard, you know, to identify when you're actually going to appoint somebody until you actually make some decisions about, well, this is the deadline and this is the process and, and let's schedule at least, you know, a Saturday if it's a Saturday or a special meeting. Um, you have to make some decisions, then we can help you in terms of how long it's going to be open. Um, there is no timeline. There is no emergency. Um, as Councilor Clark was saying. This is entirely up to you in terms of the process. Um, Given the noticing requirements and the opportunity for to get information out to the public as well as for staff to prepare, it wouldn't, I don't think it could logistically be before November 18th. Okay. I think November 18th so, would be the first regular meeting right. for you guys to make an appointment. And that would be potentially pretty tough, depending on... If we were ready. If you were ready. I think that's kind of tight. I mean, I think we should aim for the second. Because I think that if we're trying to shove it all in... Yeah, we don't actually have a meeting on the second. That's the Board and Commission's dinner. Oh, right. So 16th, I, then. Yeah. 16th. I was going to propose we declare the vacancy tonight. We take applications until... And this is just an idea, open to suggestion. Um, take applications until October 27th, which is 20 days approximately. It's a Monday. That gives staff an opportunity to, you know, process the applications, PDF them. And if they were to get a large volume, they need some time to do that. And then we could potentially have in the council's hands all the applicants by November 3rd, which is a Monday, I believe, and then schedule interviews on the trying to be respectful of Thanksgiving, too, um, the 8th and or the 15th, which are two Saturdays. And perhaps on the application, we could ask a candidate, I mean, an applicant, if they prefer a morning slot or an afternoon slot, and then see if we can. And that way, we have some time to <coughs> spend with them. We will have a little bit of time to think about it before we potentially cast ballots on the 18th. And then if we're not, if we're not ready or... Uh, we need more information, we could on that second just hold a quick meeting after or before our boards and commissions uh, appreciation dinner that night. But that's not, I don't think, too quick of a process. Three weeks for applicants, a week for staff, a week for us to review them before we interview, and then perhaps interview over two Saturdays. I think that Mayor Middleton wrote about this and made a good point that if we compress it into the election season, then we are excluding all of the candidates that will not win in the election. And so shouldn't we leave it open to, we've got a great group of candidates that are um, working hard to be elected and should they not be elected, they obviously still want to be on council. And then you just eliminate them by having the process within the election cycle. Well, I would encourage them to apply. I yeah, would encourage absolutely. anyone who, who is on the ballot now 
to go ahead and, and, and get their name in the hat here. They can always withdraw if they're successful in the election. I would absolutely yeah, encourage There's you. nothing that says they can't apply. But then we have a vacancy again. So you're just recreating no, a vacancy. No, no they can oh, withdraw huh. prior to the, to the, uh, to the uh, interviews. They could, if they if they win on the on the fourth, then they're just not going to be interviewed. Yeah, you. Won oh, okay. So what you're saying? Okay, so you do your first interviews four days after the election, mm -hmm. yeah. and the eighth and or the fifteenth, depending upon how many people apply. I guess I'm I'm curious to know how you think this process is exclusive to people who are running for council. I think she was thinking no, they no, no. can't apply. Yeah, I was thinking oh. they can't apply. No, no, no. I wasn't well, saying apply. it was they exclusive. Can. I was saying that we didn't want to exclude them. That's what I was Correct. saying. Okay. But yeah, I, I, I don't think we any of us have any any uh, intention of excluding anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I know. Yeah, that was my only concern. Yeah, that was that was my only concern. I wasn't yeah. I, I, I wasn't saying you were trying to. I was just yeah. saying let's make sure that we're thinking about that because we've right. got this great group. And we don't want to exclude them from, you know, the sure. process of being Absolutely. appointed. Absolutely. You know, I mean, they obviously yeah, want we'll to be on council, so. They're, they're probably more prepped to fill out an application than anybody. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they'll and be the first applications in. Obviously, yeah. they know that, you know, six of them will be not serving on the council, but could serve in another capacity. But I'm sure everybody's pretty honed in on their ideals and concerns and um, probably actually puts them at a slight advantage. So, um, any comments on council about Saturday interviewing? Good, I like bad. it better. I mean, it, it answers my concern about not having enough time. I don't like I don't like being prep stressed like on at night. short interviews, and I think that that works at night especially exactly. Yeah. So that I think it's great. It it certainly uh, answers that concern. Yep, builds more flexibility in for the candidates. Councilor Butterfield. I personally don't like the Saturday, but. I will go with whatever the council suggests. Okay. Councilor Clark? I'm, I'm also not super excited about the Saturday. <laughs> you know, we did the budget meeting on Saturday, and um, it wasn't well, overly fun. I agree. Some applicants might but, not like it either. Right, Why don't we have but, a Saturday and a oh. Tuesday or Saturday <laughs> and a Monday and tell the applicants, let them choose, to choose your day, mm -hmm. and we'll be there for you either day. That's, you know, yeah, I can certainly do it Saturday. Um, the only other uh, thing that I would point out is uh, the 8th would be Veterans Day weekend. So we probably don't. Do we not have school on the 10th? Right. There's no school on the 10th. So that's probably not a good choice. Well, yeah. Um, city's, city Hall is closed the right. 11th, right? We're closed right. on the 11th. Right. right. So I would but say. We could do the. I don't know what the availability about, you know, in the room or rooms. We're ready to answer that question okay. those, if, if um, those come up. So. so if we did some interviews on the 8th and maybe some interviews on the 12th or 13th, or either of those nights, Wednesday, Thursday, do them I, I wouldn't do any on the 8th. Yeah, we're skipping the 8th because it becomes Cause a it becomes the four-day weekend. Yeah, it's a four-day weekend for the – I mean, everyone's going to be – or a lot of people will be trying okay, so to now, every So go like little, 12, are we looking the 12th or 13th and then the 15th. Yeah. Okay, 12th, 13th, and or 15th. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do those look like? For room availability. Room. 12th, 13th, 15th. Sylvia's checking on the room real quick, so. Well, it would really be that room, correct? Yes. I mean, applicants could, you know, wait out here and then... It would be the small um, It's a work room. session, so it's open to the public, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so, or they could wait in there, but I don't know if we could fit everybody in there, but we could rotate. The, the 12th is wide open. Okay. The uh, 13th is wide open. And I'm sorry, what was the other date? 15th, Saturday. Um, there's obviously nothing on a Saturday. Okay. So, can everybody um, on the council maybe check their calendars? Wednesday the 12th, Thursday the 13th, and then Saturday the 15th. Yeah, technically I have a meeting in Hillsborough on the 13th. Is that CDBG? Um, yeah, so I could maybe can send Kristen, Kristen Schweitzer go. if she's available. But I don't have anything on the 12th. Yeah. And is there? does anybody have any knowledge of a like a large or very well-attended community event on the 15th? Yeah, I'm not available on the 15th. Or, or the night of the 14th. 
I'm sorry. The, the night of the 14th. I could do the day of the 14th, but not the night. And the two. What about the 13th? Uh, 13th is fine. Okay. Is anybody else not available on the 15th? And we don't know about Mayor Middleton, but. Okay. Well, if we intend to point on the 18th, then I think that those are the two dates that probably work the best, unless we do um, the evening of the 12th and the evening of the 13th, but that sort of defeats my purpose of having people be not be fresh. Hold all three of them open, and if you don't need the 15th, just cancel it. Right. Oh, 12th, 13th, and 15th? Yeah. Because some applicants may not be able to make the two we pick, give them three choices. And we only have to come in for one applicant. That's going to be so a be long week. Well, because we're going to want to have the opportunity to think about it over the weekend, too. Well, right, because then we'll have Monday and Sunday. Right. Could you possibly phone in on the 15th? Um, to listen and participate, maybe. or maybe we may not need it, but I'm not not 100. percent I might okay. be able to. Okay. Well, why don't can, can we agree that those are semi um, good, but maybe tentative for the 15th? It just mm -hmm. depends on how many. Well, and I think we can put on the application form when they submit their application hmm? their preference. Okay. Wednesday, Thursday, or Saturday the 15th. Okay. okay. The other option would be to move it to Monday the 17th, uh, which is on the, the calendar, but that doesn't give us a lot of time to consider applicants. I guess if, n if some one of the applicants cannot make the 12th, 13th, or 15th, we could possibly <coughs> interview them on the 17th. Do we have anything? Um, in City Hall on the 17th, Sylvia? Let's just do it on the 12th, 13th, and the 15th. Okay, well, I'm trying to be flexible here. I'm trying to be patient. I know you are. I can tell. Yep. <laughs> Your lack of patience is seeming towards me. Monday the 17th is, uh, you have um, three items booked in that room. Another reason not to do it. Three items booked in that room that night? The daytime, 10 a.m., 4 p.m. No, and 6 but the evening of the 17th. After 6 p.m. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's an item book 6 to 8:30. Okay, in here. In there. In there. Hmm. Can they possibly relocate? It's Cultural Arts Commission. Sure. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> let's stay with the 12th, 13th, and 15th, and hope that everybody has the opportunity to maybe open their schedule for um, the 12th through the 13th. And again, those will be work sessions, no regular meeting, they'll be open to the public, and they'll be here. Yes? Yes, sir. Looking for non Sounds good. Ready? Okay, nine, so. Nine. Um, so the date of the applications, again, just for Okay, clarity. so I was proposing, and again, open to, we would, we would receive applications until, I guess, 3 or 5 o'clock on the 27th which is 20 days, Make it that's five. a Monday, and then staff will have the opportunity to, well, Sylvia, I don't know, you know, we all know it's Sylvia, a week to process them, and then we would receive them either, if you want a paper copy or electronic copy, on the 3rd of Monday, and then we have a week and a half now to review them. There's nothing that prevents us from calling up an applicant and asking questions, correct? Well, I would probably stay away from that. Okay, well, I mean, if there's a clarification or something, we can ask them to cover it, I guess, in the I think interview. That, that's the better way to do that. Right. Is so, in the interview process. Okay. And I guess if we need information, we can go through staff. Yes. Um, if something was omitted or. Okay. And so the next item, uh, I believe, is. Linda, if he gets to make for, a comment about marijuana, why can I not comment on this? Because this is not an ordinance, this is a resolution. And we've already adopted the resolution. So this is just council uh, discussion. Um, so we need to develop a 
list of questions that the council would like to propose in addition to, I assume, what Councilor Grant said, uh, prior to just the data that we have on this application. That's correct. But okay. I would so. want to have a deadline to get that squared away um, okay. because you're going to have applicants that are going to want to fill the application out sooner rather than later. Right. So the sooner we can get that together um, for the benefit of the applicants, okay. the better. Okay. So one way to approach that would be to have the applicants fill out the vacant counselor position, perhaps add the last question if council is inclined to do that, and then post a list of questions we want the candidates to be prepared to answer before the interviews, but not have them uh, write them. Write them. Um, the other option is that, is there anybody on council who wants to be part of a subcommittee to come up with a list to propose to council? I, I think that we would potentially put ourselves in a position of, of uh, impropriety if, if a single counselor was forming the questions. I think we should Well, just there would be a committee of three, oh. like we've done with when we hired Joe or when we hired Sylvia to propose it, but. A committee of three would be a quorum, so you could not have a committee of three. Because you're only six now. Oh, right. Thank you. Two and a half. For reminding two, us. Two plus Sylvia. Two and a half. <laughs> Okay. Well, council. So what we have in front of us is an application that is, you know, fairly generic. So do we want to, are you in favor of adding that last question and sticking with this? Or are we going to develop a list of supplemental questions to give to, can to applicants? I think Butterfield's got something. Go ahead. Councilor I Butterfield. say we, we add your last question, but during the interview process, yeah. if we have a question we want to ask them, we can. Yeah. yeah, sure. So we don't necessarily have to develop a list. In advance. Everybody's going to hear the question, and everybody's going to have privy to it. Okay. So let's not waste our time on writing down proposed questions. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to ask a candidate. Yet. Yet. So just for clarity, I pulled up your email that you had sent out. The question that you were suggesting adding to the application form that you have in front of you is, what do you believe are the three most important issues facing our city in the next two years? Okay. So now, now that this is taking shape, do you need a resolution from us or a bunch of head nods? You get the idea of what we're looking for. Um, head nods are fine. I, I would like to have all five head nods. So I guess yeah. if there's someone that has any heartburn about this process, speaking up now would be preferred so we can get moving. Um, we decided on the 27th for an application deadline, right? Yep. Okay. Five the application with the additional question. We've got some tentative dates for interviews. How quickly can we get the application on the website and noticed? Brad, Brad probably already has it on there. Yeah. Okay. All the materials can be on the website tomorrow. I still, I still think it's a little too compressed. I, I still think that it's a little too compressed. You know, with the election season, I think that the people who are running are going to be busy running. And um, having them applying and interviewing, I just I think giving it a couple extra weeks is not going to is not going to change anything. So they just have to fill out one easy form before the election. Nothing else happens before. There's no election. interviews. This thing just says like, what's your occupation, your education, <laughs> by the twenty seventh, and the interviews are all after the election. Can this be a fillable form, or do they print it? Way. Is it a fillable form? No, currently, no. Okay, well, I don't want to really exhaust a lot of staff time making it fillable if we can just print it or. Okay. Okay. So. We're all set. So your comments are noted. Do you feel it's too compressed? 
and depending upon how many people apply, we may, it's not like it's set in stone, just like an ordinance, we can amend it or repeal it, or um, we can revisit the process if we'd like to in the, in the near future, but at least staff has direction and they can get going and people know what the process is and they can certainly call staff if they have questions. <coughs> Okay, so council, if I can just recap, we're going to extend the date on the public notice to October the 27th at 5 p.m. Okay. Okay. At the conclusion of that, I'll forward all um, applications of the council for your review. The app uh, on the application itself, we'll add the question. Uh -huh. um, on the application, you want me to propose the three meeting dates that applicants can select which date they would prefer. Do you want me to indicate a time? or just a date well obviously it's going to be the evening during yeah, the week then, then yes evening so yeah yeah so do you want a 30 minute slot for each candidate or a 15 minute slot how much time do you want to have with each candidate well it depends on the number of candidates yeah um i'd say no less than 15. so what if we don't specify a time we just specify yeah. date don't specify okay you might just want to tell them it's in the evening, right? If it's a 6 to 8 p.m. evening we'll kind do of do 6 on forward. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And again, that's a work session open to the public. Correct. Okay. Any other outstanding issues for staff? I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for council? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for the calendars. Next on our agenda is a resolution 2014-064 to approve and ratify a successor collective bargaining agreement and letter of agreement between the City of Sherwood and the Sherwood Police Officers Association and authorizing the city manager to execute uh, these agreements. Tom Pessimer. Uh Good evening, Council. Um, so before you is a resolution to um, ratify a successor uh, agreement, collective bargaining agreement, letter of agreement. Um, staff uh, worked um, hard with the Sherwood Police Officers Association to come up with an agreement that we feel um, it, it is a good agreement and that uh, works uh, well for both um, the city and for the Police Officers Association. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole staff report. I, I was fairly detailed in the changes that ha happened to the agreement, so if you have any questions, um, certainly let me know. Um, but other than that, I would just uh, say that um, both sides worked really hard. I was very impressed with the Police Officers Association, their professionalism, and the um, way that they really worked hard to make sure that, um, that this agreement would hopefully um, really put into place things that will last for a long period of time and that can then work well for um, the smooth operations of, of uh, our police department. So um, with that, unless you have questions, um, I'll turn it back to you. Questions of staff, council? I I one out of a few people asked me, Tom, when they saw this on the agenda, how this might be affected if uh, the new council, after January 1, 2015, elects to uh, outsource police to Washington County. Uh, well, certainly, um, if that was a decision that, that was made, there would have to be um, significant no negotiations with the union um, to uh, to deal with the with the contract that's in place. Um, you certainly you simply have a contract in place. You can't just um, ignore it um, and pretend that it doesn't exist. So there probably would have to be <coughs> midterm negotiations with the union and the county um, at that point, um, and potentially the city as well, in order to come to a successful place where um, they could uh, be. Um, this this agreement could go away or would be folded into the county's agreement so I can't answer that in particular because there would be a lot of variables there but it would certainly take a lot of work all right thanks yeah I would imagine that would be a year-long process mm -hmm. of staff time and county time and and um, a lot of uh, vetting financially contracts, equipment, it would probably take a year, I would, I would imagine, uh, before anything like that could even, we would even be ready to be at the table, so. Yeah, and I can't 
kind of specifically, I do know that Cornelius went through this not too terribly long ago, and they were able to work it out, but it was something that, that certainly had to be dealt with um, during the process. Right. <coughs> Councilor Grant, do you have any questions? No, none. thank you. Councilor Clark? Okay, I had one question. Um, so we are on page uh, 45 of our packet. We talk about premium pay. And um, <clears throat> so actually it's on page 46. The advanced certificate, that is a training certificate that an officer can receive? That's correct. Both the intermediate certificate and advanced certificates are, are um, certificates they can read received through the um, State of Oregon Department of Public Safety and Standards. Okay. And then do we have anybody at the police department with a master's degree? I was just curious. You know, I, I don't have the list of, okay. of um, people in front of me. Jeff, do you have okay. it on top of your head? I do not believe so um, in the association, but I, I could be wrong. But off okay. the top of my head, I do not believe so. There are a couple people in the staff that do but not I okay. don't believe any in the association and so this contract would be in effect until June of 17 June 30th of that's 17? What's proposed yes okay mr. Okay. Langer did you have any other questions no that was my one I'm good okay is there a motion will we approve resolution 2014-064 I don't think your mic's up. Is your mic up? I'm sorry. I, I move we approve okay. resolution 2014-064. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. Resolution 2014-064 to approve and ratify a successor collective bargaining agreement and letter of agreement between the City of Sherwood and the Sherwood Police Officers Association, SPOA, and authorizing the city manager to execute the agreements. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next item is uh, Resolution 2014-065, authorizing the city manager to sign a contract with Kogan Owens Kogan uh, to concept plan the urban reserve areas west of, exist west of the existing city of Sherwood urban growth boundary and conduct a citywide housing needs analysis. You stole my Crap. thunder. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, Please don't make me say that again. <laughs> So uh, before you is a uh, request now, this is the third time that you've seen this, uh, um, to actually authorize the city manager to enter into an agreement um, to do the concept planning for, <clears throat> it's roughly 1,291 acres that would be potentially included into the city over the next 50 years. So almost doubling the size of Sherwood over the next 50 years. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen every 50 years. I mean, it's not going to happen necessarily in 50 years, but each time Metro looks to expand the urban growth boundary um, and they're on a six-year cycle, they'll be looking at the urban reserve areas first. And so this is our opportunity at the um, process funded by Metro at $221,000 to allow us to actually look at what roads, where roads should go, uh, where utilities should go. Um, it's our first opportunity to sit down and talk with the landowners out there and then here at the city and just um, talk about how that area would be governed as it came in and to look at a phasing program to say, see where it makes most sense uh, economically and for the orderly and efficient um, expansion of the city to ask for um, areas to come into the city. So um, I'm available for questions uh, if you have any. Could you just frame the area for those people who will be watching later and maybe the audience when you say, Sherwood West concept plan. So it's an area west of Elbert, basically west of Elbert, south of Shoal Sherwood Road. Um, uh, it goes all the way south to Chapman, um, or Highway 99, and um, probably, well, it goes as far uh, west as that, um, I can't remember the name of the road where the red sled, or uh, sleigh bells. Chapman. That, that is Chapman, so as far west as Chapman. Um, so it includes quite a bit of area in it, even up and around, if you um, come up 
uh, down Shoal Sherwood to Roy Rogers Road, that area, that big farmland down in that area is included in this area as well. And then I see we don't have our screen down tonight. I'm not sure why, but we have a project schedule. Do you have a project schedule? It's approximately a 14 month. Of our it's uh, it's approximately 14 months, um, and um, we've um, been working with the planning commission, obviously. For us, because it is a pre-concept plan, um, uh, citizen participation is huge. So when we went out to um, RFP with the folks that um, Kogan Owens, Kogan, the idea was is that we are going to make this a very citizen participatory heavy process because we don't want people coming in with the um, idea that this is an area we're asking to come in right now and you're not going to see the city grow by 1,291 acres in the next five or six years. Right. But it's an, our opportunity to look into the future and see what makes the most sense for the city as, it, as we do expand. And Growth is coming. <laughs> and that's why we do it, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So. And can you um, give an example of a similar process that we've had here in Sherwood that people might be able to reference? This, this would be a new process. It's not uh, Metro in the past. We did the Brookman Road concept plan, and that is a concept plan. Uh, previously, Metro required that within three years of coming into an urban growth boundary, you had to have a concept plan in place, and that's what Brookman did. Um, this will not get to the level of assigning zoning to um, pieces of property. It will okay. talk about land uses and forecast um, what type or how much housing would be needed over that time or how much could be accommodated within the area. Um, with the utilities, um, streets, um, but it's, it, it's a relatively, this would be the first process in the metro area for uh, planning the urban reserve areas. And, and if I can just add on to that, um, everything that Brad said is correct. Um, the reason why it's it's different than we've seen before is it's a new paradigm with the urban reserves. And so when um, metro adopted the urban reserves, they also adopted a new process where um, for any area that's going to, they didn't want another Damascus, essentially. They didn't want to bring an area into the UGB that hadn't gone through some level of concept planning. And so what this is, like I'm, what this um, is going to do is allow us to do that, that high level concept planning. Obviously, when it's brought into the urban growth boundary, there would need to be refinements as it's brought in. Again, as Brad said, we would not expect this to come in um, as a whole. Um, and if it did, I think we would object pretty strenuously. Um, so we, we would expect that over the next, you know, many years, up to 50 years or even beyond, that this would um, come in incrementally. But by having a plan, we'd know how it should come in, how it could come in, kind of what, what we need to be thinking about in terms of road sizes and infrastructure sizes, so that um, in 50 years, it, you know, we're able to, to deal with what we have. Any questions for Brad or Julia? I have a motion? I'll move we approve resolution 2014-065. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item is thank you, Brad. Thank you. Public hearing ordinance 2014-019 establishing a, a tax on the sale of marijuana and marijuana infused products in the city of Sherwood and adding a new chapter 3.25 to the municipal code. Mr. Gall. Actually, I'm going to quickly hand this over to oh, Mr. Mr. Crean, Crean because I think uh, a lot of these questions um, are going to come out of the legal realm. Um, so I'll let him introduce it and we'll fill in as needed. So go ahead, Chris. Uh, thank you, Joe, um, Council President, members of the uh, City Council. Yes, in front of you is a proposed ordinance that would establish a um, gross receipts tax for the sale of medical, or, or sorry, sale of marijuana products and marijuana infused products uh, in the city of Sherwood. It's not a sales tax, it's a gross receipts tax, so it's imposed on the seller, not a buyer. Um, it's also, um, it's the explained in the staff report, not imposed further up the supply chain, but on the final seller to the consumer. It's modeled ultimately on an ordinance that began in Ashland, uh, has since been modified and adopted in, um, as far as I'm, I've been involved, Hillsborough and 
uh, Happy Valley, but I was just reading uh, online, it's also been adopted in Forest Grove, Cornelius, Portland is looking at it. Um, Fairview, I understand, has adopted a similar ordinance. So um, it's something that is gaining traction in municipalities around the state. Um, it, the ordinance includes uh, provisions that require the uh, seller to maintain ac accurate and adequate records, allows the city to uh, inspect those. Um, the certain contain certain provisions that um, for deductions from the gross receipts amount so for example if you sell uh, m marijuana and the person returns it discovering that they what they've been smoking all those years was in fact or uh, oregano and they'd prefer to keep doing that and they bring the marijuana back to you <clears throat> And you give them a refund, you don't. You can deduct that from your total sale amount. So we, you know, those kinds of adjustments are in here. Um, and this would, because it's a tax, it can't take effect in less than 30 days. So if you approve it tonight, it would take effect 30 days from today, uh, which would be just after the election. But before, um, I, I should back up and say this is largely in response to Measure 91, which is on the ballot November 4th, um, in the event it passes and allows the sale of uh, recreational marijuana and marijuana-infused products in Oregon. This would allow uh, a municipality to tax the sales of those. So. This would take effect after the election, but before Measure 91 takes effect. Um, there is some question about whether or not it's preempted by state law, but um, as we discussed in the work session, this would uh, allow the city to at least argue that uh, because it was enacted prior to Measure 91 taking effect, it's grandfathered in under the provisions of Measure 91. Um, also, t uh, two other things, there's nothing in the measure that requires the city to allow the sale of uh, marijuana uh, and marijuana products in the city. Um, as you know, there's currently a moratorium on medical marijuana dispensaries in the city that expires, we believe, in May or June. Um, in the event Measure 91 does not pass, there's nothing in this that uh, requires the city to allow dispensaries or other sales outlets. Uh, it simply says if they are allowed, um, the city can tax the sales. Uh, also, under federal law, um, the Controlled Substances Act prohibits the uh, delivery of a controlled substance. There's nothing in here that would put the city in a position of delivering a controlled substance. Um, but again, only if that controlled substance is, in fact, sold within the city, it would allow the city to tax it. Um, finally, the tax in general is 10% on uh, gross revenue uh, after adjustments. Um, with an exception for medical marijuana, um, if you look at, and I'll, I want to be specific about this so people can go to the packet and find these provisions, um, and this is on page 75 of the packet, it's proposed section 3.25.030, paragraph B under there, you can see it's divided into two subsections, B1 and B2. B1 is the tax for medical marijuana. Um, there, as a policy argument, it has been argued that, or as a policy statement, it's been argued that um, we don't currently tax medication, and so to the extent marijuana is a medication, we shouldn't tax it. And so therefore, medical marijuana is split out, and currently we're, this ordinance would propose to tax that at 0%. It gets it on the books and allows subsequent city councils to change that if they so desire. Under B2 would apply to all the sale of all other marijuana, marijuana-related products, and those would be uh, taxed at 10%. So uh, just wanted to be clear, the, the ordinance distinguishes between medical marijuana and all other marijuana-related uh, products. I'm sorry, not related products, so pipes, papers, and other things do not. It would just be marijuana and marijuana-infused products would be taxed at 10%. So I hope that's clear. Uh, I hope you had a chance to review the ordinance, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got one question. Um, and just remember, we have to, you know, take public yeah, um, this is comment. Fine. But so this ahead. is a good one for him. Um, I, so I understand that the seller has to actually write the check and send it to the state. But is there anything in here I didn't see it that that prohibits the seller from charging the uh, buyer the tax on top of the sale, much like a sales no. Tax. Uh, um, I'll amend your comment. The, te the check would go to the city, not to the state. Oh, okay. Uh, I I'm assume the state will have sorry, its own yeah. taxes, but you know, right, right. their battle. But, um, good, thanks. But yes, and in fact, we discussed that in the staff report, um, looking at the, the proper point in the process from you know manufacturing, delivering, sale, consumption. At what point do you does the city want to impose a tax? And um, 
it, it could be imposed at the manufacturer from the sa at the point of sale from the from the say the grower to the retailer, but in, in the nature of a value added tax. But we just don't have very much experience with that kind of, of tax. But the assumption is any of those are going to be passed along to the consumer. Um, if you sell a product and you have to pay taxes, wages, all of your business expenses are built into the cost of your product, and so it's assumed that that would be the, also would be the case here. Sylvia, you want to open, open public the public hearing? hearing? Mm -hmm. sure. Let's take citizen comment, please. Sure. Okay. You can do that. You want me to do that? Okay. So we'd like to open the public hearing on this ordinance, pro or con. And if you're interested in coming up, um, you can fill out a form and under the subject line, put marijuana tax. There's so no it's Anthony. No oh, Just providing forms. Pardon? Staff is currently getting formed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just give us a minute while staff probably runs some copies. So, is Mr. Bevel still here? There he is we, in the back. Yeah. We can we can start hearing the comments now. Though. Sure. They, they can fill out the form later. So, okay. I think I'll go with Mr. Bevel first since he's been waiting the longest. Southwest Lindley Sherwood. Um, I was going to be facetious, but I'll be a little more serious. Um, we're going to we're thinking about taxing marijuana, but you know, at the same time, this is a controlled substance. You look at liquor. I mean, when I go buy, you know, beer at Safeway, Albertson, or wherever, I don't get taxed on that. Uh, if I go buy a, something that people might consider equally, you know, harmful coffee, I don't get taxed on that. So uh, I'm just raising this question because it's just in my head and, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. I may be a bit naive, but, you know, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to differentiate between that. So, you know, if you're going to tax the recreational marijuana, why not recreational coffee? recreational alcoholics just a thought thank you thank you <clears throat> anybody else pro or con um, we don't tax state liquor does. but the state taxes liquor state yeah okay. yeah just like gas tax too Hi, I have a question. My name is uh, Naomi Bella. I have a question since you brought up earlier the quorum idea. Now we have a council of six. Uh, I'm just wondering what the process is if three councilors do meet together and discuss anything, whether it's a marijuana tax or, you know, who they're going to appoint to the next to fill the council. Uh, because three of the councilors were seen on Saturday um, at the ICE arena, um, Matt Langer, Dave Grant, and Linda Henderson. So I'm wondering what the process is with that. <clears throat> Saturday? Who? Aren't we talking about marijuana? Um, yeah, this is a public. I would just like to know what the, what, the, what the process is and what, if that is allowed to happen. You know? I, I'd be glad to, to speak to you offline, but in general, you know, members of an elected body can, can all be at a social gathering and it doesn't violate the public meetings laws. But is that a quorum? No. No, it's not. Okay, so what is a quorum? Uh, three is three. Again, we're getting off topic. I mean, the, the, we're engaged in a public hearing on whether or not to adopt a, an ordinance that would allow the city to tax medical marijuana. Um, if you'd okay, like well, to speak to that, that would be great. Otherwise, I, I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Okay. So do you have a case for or against a medical marijuana tax? I know I don't think so. Okay. Thank can you. We, can we speak even though we don't have sheets? Um, yeah, because she's getting in. Yeah, can. She's going to us. The, the purpose sure. of the sheets is to make sure we get in the yeah. record who's speaking. So speaking just, go ahead, name the just go ahead and make sure okay. you have your name so, in the go record. Ahead, Dean. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dean Boswell at 22796 Southwest Lincoln Street, Sherwood, Oregon. Um, you know, at the risk that I might offend people, I'm all for taxing it. Um, everything in the news and everything that you read about it, the reason that uh, 
we're even suggesting legalizing marijuana um, around the U.S. is for tax. So if it can help improve our roads, improve our schools here in Sherwood, then I say tax it. Uh, I'm not against it. Um, also, maybe this is even worse. <laughs> if it's medical marijuana, tax it more because it's probably going to be covered by insurance and you're going to get more from the insurance companies. So uh, there's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. Would anybody else like to give testimony on this ordinance? And we need, please don't forget to fill out a form when the forms arrive. Okay. So hearing no others, I'll close the public hearing. And council discussion. I wanted to uh, point out a couple things. I don't, I don't uh, sure. disagree with Mr. Boswell. I, I think it needs to be understood that future councils will decide what the tax amount is. This is a placeholder, really. I completely agree with what you're saying, uh, but it's really, we're just really preserving our right, or actually preserving future council's right to act. Um, if we don't, we're essentially by default binding the hands of future councils not to be able to act because of potential preemption by the state. So it's really a placeholder in there for future councils to decide. Yeah, and November 4th is the deadline date. Yeah. Reference to what you're right, we about. have to do this before November fourth, or else we risk being preempted. Any action like this being preempted by the state. That's why we're jumping all over this. Not not to pick a number or not to make a, a final decision just to preserve our right as a city. Right. Well, I, I personally am all for taxing and doing whatever else we can do to keep it from coming to our city. I'm not for any kind of marijuana. Period. So I'm just making that public. Council President, do we need to close the public hearing and bring it back to council? I did. So she did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so just a just a note. Um, uh, in the future, if a council is able to um, implement this tax, the tax money will go into the general fund. So it's not targeted for any one specific service, but will help to pay for all those services that are a draw on the general fund, including. Um, facility maintenance. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else you want to add? Okay. So, anybody willing to make? Uh, I move we adopt Ordinance 2014-019, establishing a tax on the sale of marijuana and marijuana-infused products in the city of Sherwood, and adding a new Chapter 3.25 to the Municipal Code. I second. Okay. Go ahead, Sylvia. Ordinance 2014-019, establishing a tax on the sale of marijuana and marijuana-infused products in the city of Sherwood and adding a new chapter 3.25 to the municipal code. Councillor Clark? Aye. Councillor Langer? Aye. Councillor Butterfield? Aye. Councillor Grant? Aye. Council President Henderson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Uh, next on our agenda is citizen, or council announcements. Clark? Well, I'll go last because I didn't know about this before the meeting. I'll go first. Okay. Um, as the liaison to the Parks and Rec Board, we had a meeting this week, earlier in the week. Uh, they did two things. One, we talked about finalization of the Woodhaven Park facility. So that is moving along, and we're trying to get to the point where we can actually get costing for that on top of that they've been working diligently with trying to resolve what kind of amenities we're going to have in our proposed dog park and i think that they finally got that narrowed down so we can go to the next step which is defining what the, those costs are to build that park so once those costs are out uh, of course the public will have all kinds of opportunities to weigh in but uh then we'll decide, you know, how we're going to fund these parks, how we're going to maintain them, and how we're going to integrate them in our community. Okay, thank you. Councillor Grant or Langer? Uh, well, um, some of mine had to do the cha with the chamber. Are you going to do chamber? Uh, you're, yeah, you're, I've got a few things. You want me to go? Oh, okay. Why, why don't I let you do that? And you, okay. you go first, and, and then I can, I can. That's all I really had. So go ahead. Sure. Okay. Well, I got a whole page to run through here. Uh, busy month. The uh, YMCA first. Uh, they had a very successful uh, Zumba Fest last Friday with multi-generational 
attendance from young kids to seniors. The Harvest Festival is coming up uh, Saturday, October 25th on the sport court with a tent or a treat. There will be lots of tents, uh, treats, and activities for all ages from four to six. On Friday, October 24th and Saturday the 25th from 7 to 10 p.m., is, there's going to be the annual Haunted Teen Center. So uh, keep a short leash on your teens that night. Uh, Saturday, <laughs> November 1st is the 12-hour walk and run from 6.30 a.m. for the early birds all the way to 6.30 p.m. to raise funds for the annual community campaign. There will be lots of prizes and activities. Saturday, November 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. there will be an all-staff meeting. So the Y will close early at 5.45 p.m. so the staff is able to attend. That's Saturday, November 8th, 6 to 8 p.m., closing at 5.45. Now on to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Onion Festival is this Saturday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Archer Glen Elementary. So come one, come all, come eat an onion and uh, mm. have some have some fireman's well rotary chicken. And uh, the chamber monthly chamber breakfast for October is uh, Tuesday, October 14th at 7.15 a.m. That's 7.15 a.m. early breakfast at the YMCA Teen Center catered by Symposium Coffee. Thanks to the Bateses. And uh, on September 18th, so this is already passed, the chamber had a highly successful uh, golf tournament and a big thanks out to the design and leadership team and especially to uh, Scott Gavick. <coughs> All I've got. Okay. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, got the Onion Festival. The uh, I wanted to uh, say that the the uh, Chamber of Golf tournament uh, went off huge success. Uh, that became a uh, pretty good money maker for the chamber, and uh, that was what uh, the board was looking for: is is having uh, doing better at fundraising of the golf tournament, and it was it, it was great. Um, you can talk to the chamber president Keith Mays about that. Uh, but uh, congratulations to the chamber for having more successful events, so that they are not uh, reliant uh, financially on anyone other than themselves. The uh, uh, also, I went to uh, the mixer this morning at Sherwood. Uh, the chamber mixer this morning at Sherwood uh, Family. Uh, Law, is that called Sherwood Family oh, Law? Family Law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And a uh, good couple of guys, I've known them uh, for uh, a couple of months anyway, and uh, they're located in the uh, newer building, same building as uh, American Family Insurance across from uh, uh, the uh, Bank of Oswego. And uh, so uh, uh, the, the Chamber's going to be having more of those mixtures. They're trying to, uh, you know, uh, boost that activity. And uh, it was good to meet a, a, a new business in Sherwood this morning. Those are the two things I wanted to announce. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Okay. Um, I, I wish I would have gotten the call that we were going to be doing this. That would have been helpful. Um, but I will try to, by going through my calendar, uh, remember everything that, that I can um, pull out of there. One of the things that I wanted to announce is I'm very excited uh, to see the opening of SMJ Dance Studios, owned by Sarah Hatch. Um, it's right by Domino's Pizza. And so we've got another great dance studio, um, and it's very exciting to have that uh, small business opening up. Uh, the 14th is the last day to register to vote, and the ballots go out on the 15th. So uh, if you haven't registered to vote or... Are you um, sure it's the 14th? I thought it was the 4th. I think it's the 14th. No, it's the 14th. Yeah. Oh. It's the 14th. And, and so, um, you know, maybe if you're... Uh, going to be a new voter and you've turned of age, uh, get on out there and, and fill out your registration and vote in the upcoming election. Uh, the Washington County Artists Open Studios is going to be going on on October 18th. Um, our local artist, Darla Boljack, is going to be in that and you can go to her studios and see her great works. Um, and I, I have, I had the information on my website, so you can look at that to get the information, or you can go into the Washington County Artists or Open Washington County Artists Open Studios, and it's on that website as well. Got it? Okay. That I could come up with. Uh, Main Street. Pardon me. Um, yeah, that we haven't had. Haven't um, had a meeting. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> 
Councilor Grant, did you have? No, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, where do I begin? Um, I wanted to um, address an item that was in um, the paper. Uh, the mayor wrote an article, and I think he, um, the article said something about that the majority of council is not in favor of a dog park or a skate park. And we have generally tried to adhere to a rule that we don't speak on behalf of council if we're not authorized um, or appointed to speak on behalf of council which is in our council rules, which we are responsible to, um, to enforce. And so um, I try not to speak for the majority of council, which I believe is what the article said, if I'm not authorized to speak for council. So I would like to, um, to note that I, um, I personally, as a citizen and as a counselor, am for a dog park and a skate park. Um, I joined the Parks Board in 1999 with the intent of someday hoping to have a dog park, and it's taken a very long time to find a suitable piece of property and the land, and we still, this council or the future council will have the opportunity to try to, you know, be able to put that park in depending upon the cost, right? Because we don't have cost estimates yet, don't we? So. And the skate park is something um, I advocated for very early on, and... Um, the great thing about that is we already have the location, we have the land, which is usually a huge hurdle, and we just need to um, write grants or do fundraisers or partner in the community to someday help to get that done. But there are other items on the park board agenda that have been um, wanting to get done, Woodhaven Park is an example. And so it's certainly on the list, um, but currently we're still trying to find funding. Um, We'd like to thank the chamber and the high school student leader group for sponsoring the forum. And um, obviously, Onion Festival is this week. And I would like to um, echo the comments of Nancy Taylor and Mrs. Claus about um, signage and wanting to um, take the high road. Um, on those issues. I have also lost signs. I don't know why. And I'm hoping that, that, you know, that will end and people will just focus on the election and other things that are happening. Obviously, people have talked about other great things that are happening in our community. And lastly, um, something that we get to do as council time permitting is to attend an annual conference of the League of Oregon Cities with Councilor Clark. Um, Joe Gall and Julia Hyduke and I attended um, down in Eugene, and I attended I attended uh, two seminars on marijuana. I never thought I would have to say the word marijuana so many times. Um, that were on um, where I got to meet lunch with some counselors from the Seaside who had just imposed a tax for the same reasons. They're concerned about its effect on their community and also attended uh, leadership, class, leadership classes. Joe and I also attended an ethics class, which is always a good reminder for elected officials, and uh, visioning and strategic planning. And I think it was, um, it's a great opportunity for other electeds to get together and talk about what's working well in their community um, and sort of share challenges and, and um, success stories. So um, I'd encourage anybody to attend in the future if, um, they can next year it's in Bend. And can I add to that? To the can league? I just add to it? Yeah. Sure. Um, the other thing that I think that uh, Council President Henderson and I really enjoyed was um, they had a presentation at a dinner that we went to about. Oh, yes, PGE. I knew that you'd want to say that. And yes. so I just wanted to kind of remind you. Right. Because um, um, I, made, I made some notes um, right. on uh, research, education, policy, and training uh, in getting um, students from the university solving our real issues and they have this whole program um, and it, it is something that you know you, you pay for but you pay um, a minimal amount comparatively and Julia could talk on that but I'll, I, mean, I will make you I won't make you but it's just kind of an exciting opportunity to join education and sort of 
innovative ideas of, of budding students mm -hmm. um, with problems uh, that are facing cities. And I believe it was this... Sustaining Cities Initiative. Right, but what was the city? I think it was... Uh, Tigard is Tigard. just starting and Salem just Actually finished. did it. So mm -hmm. that's pretty exciting. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, we got the information and we're going to be looking into it. And I think it's a great uh, way to join education and solving problems. So. so the students actually come into our community or another community and do a lot of interviewing and research. And it's an opportunity for students from all disciplines at U of O who want to participate from the business school to the architectural school. And um, it was, a, I mean, it was something that's very much out of the box, very unique to Oregon. It's been a model program that other states have been asking uh, this professor that did the introduction to come to. And the RFP is in November, so we probably won't make it for this year, but certainly a very creative um, way to get students involved in cities and get a lot of work done in a compressed, usually a six month period. Um, and he mentioned something like 80,000 hours mm -hmm. of, you know, time that is, because we don't pay the students, but we pay for the program and the administration. And it was a really, um, and I want to thank PGE for inviting us and sort of opening our eyes to a, a, a new opportunity out there. It's pretty competitive, but Tiger was able to, um, to win a bid and they start their work, I think, in January. So we can sort of pay attention to see how Tiger, you know, how that process goes. And then um, lastly, I was wondering if um, Tom could give us an update on the Cultural Arts Center. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think it's time to start getting excited. Um, you know, the reality is, is the center is moving along um, well. Uh, the outside of the building is looking, you know, pretty drab at this point, but um, they've done a lot of work on the inside. Uh, most of the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, ventilation systems um, is roughed in. Uh, the fire system is, is roughed in, and they're they're getting very close to um, starting to put draw, drywall in and, and then uh, finishing up with the electrical and the, the um, sprung floor and, and all the finishing stuff. So um, they, uh, it, it's going to be transitioning here real quick from a construction project into um, an operating project that, um, that uh, I know Kristen is working on. Um, she's working on uh, hiring a manager for the facility. I think we're very close um, to... To making um, an offer if we haven't already and um, we're looking forward to getting some professional staff to to help us to get to the point where we can operate the facility and get it um, filled with people really quick so um, to add a little bit more specificity to construction um, the contractor is behind um, currently their contract um, days allow them up to December 2nd um, I know they're very nervous about um, being able to meet that date at this point and um, are requesting a significant number of additional days, which I don't think they're entitled to. But regardless of whether they're entitled to them or not, they're probably going to need them. So um, so I can't tell you exactly when it's going to be done. I, we still expect it to be done in December, but um, they're running into, you know, typical construction delays that are that are causing them to... Uh, to do it, they're doing a great job. I'm I'm very impressed with the quality of their construction and the way that they they've done things. But it's it's just it's a big project and it was a tight time frame. So, um, I'll give you more information as we learn more. Um, we just met with them today and we weren't able to to get enough specificity for me to give you a date. But um, overall, the project's doing great and it's, it's exciting. So, when do we think um, we'll have, I guess, a council discussion about a grand opening? Doesn't sound like we'd have a grand opening until maybe January. Yeah, I, I think tentatively, um, talking to Kristen, she's scheduled something for late January is what okay. she's thinking. I mean, we not only do we have to get the building turned over and get all the equipment in there, but you know, there needs to be some operating if you're going to do a large event in there. We don't want it to be something that um, falls apart on us the first thing. So, um, so Kristen can provide more information, certainly as the center manager gets um uh, engaged in the process, but late January, I think, is, is what is, is tentatively being looked at at this point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Could I add one more? Sure. Why okay. Not? I, I, I'm glad you pointed out the skate park issue because I, I want to speak for myself and say that I've always been in favor of a skate park. And honestly, I don't recall that many counselors ever speaking against it. Um, it's just simply a matter of when the Parks Board wants to 
um, recommend the funds. And when uh, and and we've got staff a couple of years ago gave us uh, an idea of what the impact would be on the police force uh, FTEs required. And so we have that information. And uh, but I think it was a, a council that would really like to see this someday. Uh, it's simply a matter of. Uh, like a lot of things, it'll matter of when we get the money in. And, uh, but I don't, I, I don't recall anyone being against the concept. Speaking Likewise, for myself, though. Go ahead. Likewise, the YMCA was never against the, it. The YMCA had a plan all laid out and, and you know, yeah. probably still has it there. Well, and I just wanted to say huh? that I always thought that you were Mr. Skate Park. So, <laughs> I mean, like that, I mean, I heard you speak on it many times. So I just wanted to echo that. Thank that you very I much. absolutely I think that. of you as Mr. Skate Park. I do. I so, I do. <laughs> seriously, I, that's a com and that's a compliment, just by the way. Also, Clark, thank you for that bit of information. I'll remember that. <laughs> it was absolutely meant as a compliment. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. That was absolutely a compliment. It was meant yeah, as a compliment. That's spoken from somebody who rides motorcycles. All right, um, motion to adjourn. City manager reports, please. Oh, oh yeah. Go. Oh, you try. You try. Uh, nice I have a number oh, of uh, quick items. <laughs> if Tammy can come up, we have a new staff member. We yeah, always like to introduduce. You saw Tammy earlier as a citizen. Yes. Um, yes. Nine o'clock. Sit, please. So sit. Please. Um, Kristen Schweitzer, I gave the night off, so I'm filling in for Kristen. Um, usually the supervisor introduces new staff, so she gave me a good script, so I got it uh -oh. right. Um, so Tammy's been with us since September 2nd. Um, she's worked extensively with volunteers, um, both as a regional development director of a national fundraising company and then through her own volunteer service on the Sherwood High School, High School Booster Club board for the last nine years, and she is currently... Um, the assistant to Coach Lawrence with the Bowman football program for the last seven years. I don't know if you're still doing that, though, are you? I am. You are? Okay. Not the booster club, but the football. Co okay. Um, and a football mom, right? Yes. So um, a little tidbit before you may have some questions for Tammy uh, on the volunteer programs. Uh, currently, there are 23 regular volunteers at the Sherwood Public Library who have logged over 1,300 hours already in 2014. <laughs> The Sherwood Police Department has six volunteers now who have contributed almost 700 hours from the first of the year. Tammy will be working with both of these departments to grow their volunteer base as well as to increase programs offered to our citizens. She will also work with other departments throughout the city to develop new volunteer opportunities, including, as Tom said, the Sherwood Cultural Arts Community Center. Additionally, she will be coordinating other programs such as Adopt a Road, Solve at Trasha Palooza, and Arbor Day. So you may recall in the budget we had a half-time volunteer coordinator, mm -hmm. and now we have a full-time volunteer coordinator. And uh, Tammy's been on board just a little over a month, and I think has already brought a lot of new energy and ideas, and uh, is downloading as much information from Jennifer Ortiz as possible. So um, she has not been able to be here um, to be introduced, so that's my introduction. Do you have any questions for Tammy, if anything? Councilor Butterfield, I think you probably have known her on occasion. Yeah, I actually served on the Booster Club board with mm -hmm. Tammy years ago. She's been awesome, and she's a great, great communicator. Along with her communication skills, she's always got this great big smile on her face. <laughs> so you cannot help but smile when you see her. So. That's what reminds me of her every day. That's why I wear this green wristband so when I see her, I can smile. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I just wanted to say that I know that the Booster Club is a well-oiled machine, so I think we are incredibly lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Tammy, Tammy you're a huge out. asset to the community, and thanks for taking the position. Thank you. Yeah. So welcome aboard. She beat out a lot of very good quality candidates. Yeah. We had a really good pool. I don't so. think the other candidates had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome aboard. Thank you. A couple Thank other you. things. Uh, Councilor Butterfield <laughs> mentioned what happened at the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee the other night. They also selected a park structure, a uh, oh, right. park playground for the Stella Olson playground. So you'll be seeing that soon. Uh, Craig Sheldon isn't here. He'd probably tell you a little bit more about that. Um, we're in midst this week of putting together the bi-monthly city newsletter, so people should be receiving their Sherwood Archer next week if everything goes as planned. That's the October slash November edition. And then um, Councillor Folsom isn't here, so no one talked about the VPA musical oh, right. this weekend. So uh, okay, so how do we not miss it? Oh, 
So once on this island. Yes. So opens that's this, this weekend. weekend. Um, so um, Friday, Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> I think it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday at seven thirty at the Sherwood High School Performing Arts Auditorium. So we will all be chastised tomorrow. Yes, we will. Um, and before I finish, I want to actually let uh, Chief Growth talk about another event on Saturday. I think there's so much going on on Saturday, it's kind of crazy. So, Tipicop. Oh, yay. Tipicop. Come hungry with your money, or your, yeah, your money. Your money, your money. <laughs> <laughs> Bring an appetite and a full wallet. Um, so, yeah, we'll be at the Onion Festival as well. Um, but this is our annual fall Tipicop at our Sherwood Red Robin. Always a great time, always a huge success for Special Olympics. So <clears throat> tell your friends, tell your family, and uh, we've met with the management there. They've undergone a remodel, and it looks really neat, different, um, but we will be doing whatever we can um, to try to earn extra tips for Special Olympics. I promise we will not touch your food, however, um, and they won't let us, and we don't want to. So. Please come out. I know it's a busy day. There's a lot going on, but try to find an opportunity to squeeze in a hamburger at, at some point. Um, and if you can't, let me know. I can provide you with a donation envelope anyway. So thank you. What, what, what time is that from? There will be uh, two, two, two meal services. The lunch from 11 to 3, I think, and then dinner runs from 4 to 8. So basically all day. But there may be, you know, if you showed up, there's a chance if you showed up in the middle of that period, there may not be very many there because we kind of try to get people there in shifts, so. Is Corey still here? No. He left, so. He's not. Yeah, bring it um, <laughs> There's always a chance that we can uh, get, I honestly don't know if that's a regular work day for Corey or not, so, but there's always a chance we can try to get Maybe earn, earn out front to greet people. So, okay. don't, don't knock on the car. Yeah, don't knock on the car. Um, unless there's questions for me or any of the department heads that are here, that completes my report for this evening. Okay. Um, before I entertain a motion to adjourn, I was I'd just like to thank uh, the citizens who came out tonight and those people who gave public testimony and citizen comment and those who came just to watch. It's always good to have people in the audience and people involved. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, staff.